What were we talking about on the last show? What was the last show? Dang it. And we've just recorded it. Oh! Okay, here's my idea. I'm pitching you a Christmas. You and I can do a Christmas movie, and it's uh, Tiny Scrooge. <laughs> and it's me. It's just me on Christmas. <laughs> um, I I think that might only be funny to me, and not funny to me <laughs> because it's funny, but funny to me because I like being mean to you. Trust me, it would be funny to everyone that knows me because um, Can I have when you? I came, you remember I told you that you were like, how are people going to handle you and deal with you? And I'm like, dude, they know the deal. <laughs> I lived with them for like six years. They know, and, and it just, as soon as I came in, they're telling other people, oh, you, you know, that's just the way he is. And you can't <laughs> talk, you know, people are like, good morning, Brad. And then I just look over them with disdain and sort of wave. And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's just, that's how Brad is. Remember? <laughs> I remember. Can I, can this movie have like scenes where you yell at people because they're just trying to give you a biscuit and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cause the cause the person didn't knock on your door properly. I did that to my mom. She did the same thing with the click in the nails on the thing. Just, and I said, just trying to be polite. Is someone at the door. You all could you, you please knock like a normal person? You freak out at loud noises, so people are trying to do you a favor and lightly tapping, and that can't. That's not good enough for you either. You walk. It's annoying. Walk, but well, click, click the. Click, 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 click. Walk around covering your ears all the time from loud noises. It's a sudden mystery that I have to figure out. It's like, okay, I'm hearing weird clicking sounds. Is that some, somebody knocking, I guess? Well, but the thing is... Well, let me... Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> but if someone is knocking, you say, is that someone knocking? They say, yeah. And you say, oh, okay, what? You don't yell at them. I say, but, knock like a normal person. Not, knock like a normal person. In fact, you said to me, knock like a normal fucking person. <laughs> well, I can say that to you. I can't say that to my mom. And then I open the door I... and I'm holding a biscuit on a platter. I'm actually bringing you... <laughs> you just throw it at me. <laughs> at that point, you should just throw it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's probably why I'll, why I'll never get married or... I figured that's my strategy. I need to get rich and famous first. That way people have a reason to tolerate me. Right. So you can still sit on people. <laughs> then you'll be able to sit on people because you have money. Yeah. Yeah. I think that plan is flawed. <laughs> well, so far, it's not working. <laughs> okay, everybody, quiet on the set. Film Reverie Podcast, take 67. And action. Hello, Film Reverie listeners. This is Michael Beckemeyer. And as always, I am joined by... Balding Ewok. A.K.A. Brad Kingston. And today we have... It's a, it's weird. The um, We've known each other forever. Maybe not forever, but for a long time. Um several years and uh we even both live in orlando but i only just what was it four or five months ago when was that festival yeah it was uh fred's film first right yeah yeah i don't oh yeah 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 the week before that yeah yeah so fred zero fred zero yeah. Yeah. uh only only then were we ever in the same space i was starting to think you didn't exist and you were like a mythological figure that's what i prefer <laughs> so um it seems you're... much more impressive when it's myth mythological so <laughs> yeah so you were um so tell us like where did you get where did you get started filmmaking you're just a f local filmmaker that everybody seems to know you've been around every time i talk to somebody it's like oh tim ritter and it's like no i don't i haven't ever met him people are like seriously <laughs> uh that's a very long story i I was not born with the camera in the hand, all those, the Spielbergs and the Abramses and whatnot. 
And cameras are expensive, especially in the 1980s, right? <laughs> <laughs> and they're kind of hard to, to push out. Yeah, and they were huge back then. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, that was one of those things that wasn't really practical growing up is that you would it, it never even crossed your mind, oh, I'm going to be a filmmaker. Yeah. That, uh, that was something for other fancy well-to-do people or something. <laughs> but, uh, so instead I wanted to be a comic book artist when I was a kid because that's much more reasonable. <laughs> uh, I did not know that, but you can draw a comic book um, – Low budget. Yeah, and uh, I made a lot of my own, and then I realized later that that was storyboard practice. But, uh, yeah, it wasn't until I was in, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I kind of goofed off through high school, got to college, had to pick something because I only had enough money to get through four or five years. So I was like, oh, I like to write, and I like sports, so I became a sports writer. And I was about a year into that program, and I was like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. This is excruciating, so I did it for only a decade, and <laughs> um, while I was doing that, I was desperately seeking something, some other vocation, and uh, I took a, I actually dabbled in playwriting and freeform writing, and then uh, my wife got me uh, enrolled in a community screenwriting class that was a month long. And it was a guy who had done a few things in Hollywood. He was like a basically a rewrite guy uh, for big scripts and whose name was never in the credits, but he worked on a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And I took that and I was like, oh, this, this kind of works. And so our plan was we were going to go out to L.A. and I was just going to start getting people coffee and et cetera, et cetera. And that didn't work out because... Then the economy crashed, and we were like, okay, that's a really bad idea right now. And so eventually when I, when the economy crashed, and we were at that point we were in Fort Myers, and I was kind of stuck, so it was like, okay, I better figure out how to do this by myself. Yeah. And so I got all the books I could, including Rodriguez's uh, Rebel Without a Crew, which was very yeah. foundational. And yep. it's got a lot of a lot of people got a lot of bad ideas from that book. <laughs> it's a familiar yeah. tale. Um, <laughs> that is that is the filmmaking. That's the filmmaker's handbook of the '90s. Like when I, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you were living as far from Hollywood as possible, that's really all you had to work with. So I wanted to. I started looking for people uh, making films so I could help out on their sets and. No one in Fort Myers was making films at that point. I quickly discovered, so I had to do it myself, and and from there on, just kept building and building. And now I have yeah, I've got a handful of shorts and a couple of features, and I teach film at UCF. So, so um, you were a comic book artist <laughs> up until thirteen or fourteen years old, yeah. Yeah, oh, it's other, but you can draw because I can't. I can't draw stick figures. Well, the storyboards are are not the best example of my talent because you know I storyboard every scene in a, in everything I do in a two hour films. That's a lot of pages, so they're very hasty. They are better than stick figures, but yeah, you know I went back and dug under my bed in Virginia, most recently on a trip, and looked at my old things. And oh, these look pretty good. <laughs> A lot better than my storyboards, but yeah, whatever, it works. And uh, sports writing, what uh, what convinced you, number one, to do that, and then what convinced you not to do that? Well, I you were, uh, you were a sports up. writer for ten years. Like you did that as a job. Yeah, that was a career. I had a whole career in that. <laughs> and I, moment of truth, the uh, the first feature I made was while I was working full time as a sports writer. So, huh. um. I I like to write. I was always writing growing up. I would write my own little novels, or at least the first chapter. You know how that goes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and writing exactly. my comics, and so I was like, yeah, I like to write. What's a a, a logical way to make a living doing that? And yeah. okay, newspapers. What do I like in newspapers? I like I read the sports page, so I'll do sports. And it was it's not a horrible. Some of it's horrible, but, you know, overall, people were envious of the fact that I was a sports writer. And yeah. I did 
I got to cover some cool things, but you know, chasing around coaches and basically writing about other people doing things is to me it just wasn't satisfying. I want to do things. Yeah. I don't want to write about other people doing things. So cool. So somewhere out there, there's a whole like bullpen of sports writers going. Hey, what was that guy's name? Tim. <laughs> I wonder what he's doing right now. I was a, I was pretty good at it. I think. That's pretty uh, cool. Yeah, I actually had a had a line on a on a regular AP type job here in Orlando and and walked away because I was done with that stuff. A lot of work. You work holidays. You don't get paid anything, and everyone kind of hates you as a journalist. It's not a I don't, people. I don't know why people are so mean to journalists, but <laughs> they yeah. are. So. Uh, Only now that newspapers are dying, are are we starting to get some good movies about positive journalists? Yeah, that kind of was just you know asshole journalists that were bothering people. Uh, you mean like Spotlight, the movie Spotlight? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got Spotlight, we got The Post. That kind of stuff didn't happen when newspapers were actually in their heyday. It was all like, yeah, now we're all nostalgic. Yeah, like oh, yeah. sorry, just kidding. We, yeah, you're valuable. Well, not sports. <laughs> so, like, what was your what's your what's your favorite sport? I just kind of assumed you were sort of a a filmmaking nerd like me, <laughs> and I don't care about sports at all. No, that's uh, it was. I remember the last sports story I ever did. I did a story for the Associated Press about UCF's quarterback at the time was Blake Bortles, and he's now the Jaguars quarterback in the NFL. And it was his pro day for scouts to see how good he was, for those of you who don't speak football. Um, and I was like, oh, cool. You know, I loved the draft, and I loved the NFL. I'm a football guy. And so I told some of my filmmaking people, I was like, oh, I just, you know, these were UCF people. I was like, oh, I just did a story on Blake Bortles. He's going to be, like, a top five pick in the NFL draft. And they're like, who? I was like, you guys go to UCF? Yeah. <laughs> He's the best quarterback <laughs> you've ever had. Oh, okay, cool. So... Yeah, that's Great. I'm used to not having those conversations with all my collaborators. I could talk to you generically about golf, <laughs> but not much else. Mm -hmm. yeah, so sports are great drama. Uh, they they are a great drama. That's that's what I I used to work in sports television. Uh, it was a job that got morphed into sports television, and uh, I was a behind the camera. I was a behind the scenes guy. I wasn't a writer. But um, I said one day, I was like, I don't really like this stuff. I said, <laughs> I prefer, I prefer like storytelling. And their response was, this is storytelling. Um, if you look at it, there's always, there's this person, there's this conflict, there's that suspense, there's that. And the thing is, and it, number one, pointed out to me how cynical I was being, number one, about the job I had which I was. And number two, it reminded me that it's story. It's all storytelling, um, just not the types of stories that I wanted to tell necessarily, but it was storytelling. So It's more like documentary style, which yeah. is, yeah, you, you know, you're just recording a live event, and, you know, it's not, it's just something that happened, you know what I mean? It's not something you created. Thanks, yeah, and that, that's, that's the challenging part. Yeah. For some people, that's enough. And if you're super creative, I don't know. For me, it wasn't. So, <laughs> filmmaking. <laughs> so you went from being a sports writer to mm -hmm. being a filmmaker. Uh, did you find any similarities in those two lines of work? <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, the big uh, the big thing which I have really benefited from, and I also carries over to my teaching, is deadlines. Yeah. Um, like, you know, I hear about things like writer's block, and you know, I had to, you know, you go out and you cover something, and you better figure out something to write because otherwise you're not going to have a job. And sometimes that could be as many as five events in a day that I'll be writing yeah. five unique leads for. And you just got to get done. You got to find a way to get done. So it almost trains you to turn on that spigot. You know, yeah. I've got to produce something. I'm going to go produce it. 
So I, I find that very valuable. Like as far as sports to the kind of things I'm writing, no, not at all. But more just the professional aspects and mm-hmm. you know coming in now teaching at an, at an arts program. You know, there's a lot of general flakiness and unreliability, and I I grade more on professionalism than on the you know the level of the artwork. You know, it's yeah. just like I just want to train you to be accountable and yeah. produce. Like to as you know, uh, when no one's giving you big budgets to do something, and you're not in demand, and you just got to go out and create something outside of your nine to five job. It takes a huge amount of discipline and um, uh, drive, basically. And and I think that comes from having that kind of coming from the the professional world a little bit of like, I'm going to make it happen one way or the other. I'm going to do it. I have noticed um, myself, I've noticed myself when uh, just because I'm a part time filmmaker, you know, I make movies when I can. I don't make movies like for a living. Um, and so do a lot of the people that I end up working with, you know, like cinematographer or Brad or I still don't know what Brad does, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, actors even. Actors are have a reputation for being like, like a cliched reputation being flaky. You know, like yeah, but it's really not actors. It's creative people. Creative people are just, they just sort of like head in the clouds. You know, they might forget what day it is or what time it is or anything like that. But I have noticed that I approach my, I don't like to call it this, but you could call it a hobby, you know, because <laughs> I don't think of it like a hobby. I think of, I go to work all day, and then when I come home, it's time to go to work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, So when I come home and want to go to work and start wanting to uh, get this person to commit to a date or a deadline or something like that, that they, a lot lot of times they don't think of it like that, or at least they don't seem to think of it like that, where just because we're part-time doesn't mean we can't be professional. In fact, we have to be more professional because of that. And I don't mean respectful professional, like, you know, wear a tie or dress up or, you know, but, I mean, showing up on time, doing what you said you were going to do, you have to manage your time even more consistently um, so that when you say you're going to do something, you do it and people can trust you because if we're making a short film, you might work with those people for three or four days. Um, you might have a couple of phone calls or a rehearsal or something in between there. But really, you have maybe have like less than a month of knowing that person to give that person an idea of who you are and the type of person you're going to be work with. So you have such little time to say who you're going to be to people, say how you're going to be to people, that it's even more important to be that when you're doing it the way I end up having to do it. Um, you know, it, it really does help to, because I have friends now that I've worked with or that I that I know or that know me, and they know that they can count on me. When I say I'm going to do something, I will do it. I might have to, you know, um, work around my daughter's soccer game and my job and all that stuff, but I'll get it to you by the time I said I would get it to you. And a lot of times, because of how busy everything is, I get it to you maybe even sooner mm-hmm. because it's you got to super manage your time in a way that professional world – you have 40, 50, 60 hours a week to <laughs> squeeze it in there at some point in time. I have two or three hours a night, you know. Yeah, and, that's, so, and, you, and you have to manage your commitments because of that. There's a lot of things yeah. that I just don't accept because I'm just like, I, I, I have to be realistic, and I'm not going to do it if I can't do it all the way. I'm not going to – I'll never tell you I'm going to do something and not do it to the utmost of my ability. So there's a lot of things I just don't do because <laughs> – yeah. I'm trying to do the other things right. Oh, that's what Brad does. <laughs> There's a lot of things he doesn't do. That's Brad. Are you with me? What? <laughs> no, you were saying there's a I'm lot. I'm confused. You you're saying that's what I do. Yeah. You, th- th- I don't do. Yeah, you what? don't. That's what you do. You don't do a lot of things. Oh, that's my thing. That's your thing. It's is that you don't things? do a lot of things? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay. I thought. I, okay, we're making fun of me, but I'm a really good problem solver. 
<laughs> yeah. That's my where I shine. Yeah. <laughs> I I can <could, laughs> you can show me your the script and say we're gonna shoot all these and I can figure out everything that could go wrong mm-hmm. and find solutions for them so that we could survive the day and I've done that. Continue. That's my thing. Is very important. Yeah. So um, I'm like the everything guy on set. <laughs> he he actually is. There were there were things I was busy directing. And uh, he, there were probably a thousand problems I didn't know about because he was just running around like a little. Sounds like he was. You know, <laughs> that sounds like an AD to me. Yeah. Pretty much. AD yeah. So. And audio. So mm-hmm. how did you? Um, so you started. You said, okay, I want to make. I want to make movies. Did you think you were batshit crazy, or did you think, how am I going to figure out how to do this? Since you'd never really done it before, or how'd you get into it? Uh, I think sometimes it benefits me. Did you have? Did you do film schooling? I went to video, video and TV production school. I didn't do film, but I knew the infrastructure. You know, I should chain of command and stuff. I teach film, but like, I think it's benefited me a lot not having any kind of education in it because I, I came up with a purely outside perspective of. You know, a lot of people go to film school, and I would see this when I would collaborate with them, and it's like, oh, you got to have this, and you got to have this. And I'm just looking at what are these pieces, and how can I make something out of it? And I don't have any preconceptions of, like, oh, well, it has to be this or it has to be that. And I compare it sometimes to, like, Jimi Hendrix playing the guitar upside down and backwards because no one told him otherwise. Yeah. And of, like... And then when I went to film school to get my master's, there was a lot of, well, you can't do that. And I'm like, no, I do that. I have done that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. okay, you know, like, oh, you can't shoot ten pages in a day. No, that's what we do. Um, uh, I, the, from where I come from, you can't not shoot ten pages in yeah, a day. Yeah, I know, exactly. But yeah. the difference between, like, the Hollywood mindset and the, that independent mind. So, yeah, I was just figuring out how to, to do it. Um, and it really, you know, I write and direct as you do, and I learned pretty quickly. I was smart, you know, and I, I, I guess I looked at the right materials early on because my, my first short was a single location, a single actor, and, you know, as as managed as possible of like, oh, this is not going to require any of the challenges that cause mm-hmm. headaches. And then I kind of expanded each time. And then by the time I got to the features, it was like, okay, so I know how to make a film with very little. How can I push it and kind of find creative ways to expand the scope without giving myself huge yeah. headaches? So, well, that was what we... Yeah, you have an outside-of-the-box way of thinking as opposed yeah. to let's make a list and do everything in order and just write... You're like, okay, what is it you want to do? Okay, let's figure out how to do it. Yeah, what sounds like somebody sounds like somebody who read Rebel Without a Crew. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because that's that was outside the box. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and I have thought for years that it actually said in there, "Don't ever pay for anything," um, because once you start, <laughs> once you start spending on stuff, that becomes your solution for everything. And that then I went back and looked for that quote to use it again, and I was like, oh, that quote's not even in here. And I don't know if I saw it somewhere else or what, but like, oh, you know, you just you you just like had some. It was like, it was you you created that so you can be. Like, I can do this without paying for anything. Yeah, you convinced yourself. God spoke to I him. I synthesized yeah. the the film guide. Yeah, no, he had Robert Rodriguez was his spirit film guide, and he like <laughs> sort of mm-hmm. telepathically zapped it into your head. And I and I'm not even in love with El Mariachi, but like the idea is is sound, you know. Yeah. Of how can you do it? And just figure out a way, and and the creative solution tends to be create more interesting work in a lot of ways. Not always. There's some things where it's yeah. you know the the low budget can hamper you, um, but there's a lot of you know I I come up to I come across a lot of filmmakers who are like oh I can't do it if it's not this, mm-hmm. and I'm like no, but you know find. The, the perfect film that you didn't make is worth nothing. You know, like, it's yeah. only going to be a regret. You know, make the film you can make however you can make it and make the most of it. You know, that's... The yeah, the, 
there's so many there's it's like failure to launch people that are so caught up on and I'm sure I'm very I'm sure um I've I could have made more things in my filmmaking if I had convinced myself earlier that it wasn't crazy to try to do something the way you know the way I do it from time to time I've had budgets a couple of times well I had a budget I had a decent budget once <laughs> everything else and then that kind of ruined me for a couple of years because I the, it's exactly the 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 Robert Rod we'll just give Robert Rodriguez the credit for it. <laughs> yeah. Because I I got into that area and it made me actually superficially feel like a legit filmmaker. Like I was yeah. I paid actors, I paid yeah, I paid crew and it felt good. I was like finally I can pay, I paid people. Um, um, yeah. I even and then we and then we didn't want to do anything else unless we could do it at that level right. again. And it helped kept it held me back at least psychologically. It kept me from uh, I could have we could have. We could have made our film two years earlier. Yeah, there's a feature film. Straining for legitimacy that we all go through. Yeah. Like, and I remember on my early shorts, people would come on set and be like, "What the hell is this?" You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> "How do you make a film? You know, where are all the people? Where's all the stuff?" And, <laughs> and you know, where's all the stuff? <laughs> early on, someone, you know, one of our actors left and didn't return calls after we had shot, and then we just shot around him and. Mm-hmm. And we put out a trailer, and then we got the call back, like, "Hey, I'm I'm available." It's like, "Oh, because this actually looks pretty good." It's like, "Well, mm-hmm. now that's train has sailed to quote Austin Powers." <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, but that's a lot of people get in it thinking, "Oh, I want the the glamorous behind the set." And the, well, it's just like, for me, it's just get it done, and and if the work looks good, then people will eventually buy it, even if. You're sitting yes. here holding a broom handle with a mic tangling from the end of it or whatever. <laughs> However, some there is there's the beauty of like the modern Amazon world is a, you can actually get a decent boom pole for like fifty bucks. Oh yeah. And yeah. it does its thing. It used to be. However, a broom handle is still only like <laughs> five bucks. So <laughs> it just depends. Like over years, like I have my prized possession boom pole i spent 50 dollars on that thing you know it's like but um yeah and we still ended up having to gaffer tape my uh boom mic onto it i have yeah. students now who uh think it's really cool to go and shoot on the mini hd tapes because they like the aesthetic and i'm like that's just because we never had to shoot on those things <laughs> I, I just dude, that was horror, <laughs> man. I remember doing that. Do you guys Ugh. do you guys still have tape decks to import the footage to? You know? Yeah. So what do I they do? Have, uh, I have boxes of those tapes somewhere with all kinds of stuff Me on. Me too. I've I've got an entire one of those like yeah. I've got one of those medium sized porta brace like bags that just like all purpose bags and it's full of DV tapes mm-hmm. that I haven't looked. There's short film after short film and all sorts of stuff in there. The, when they make the documentary of my life, the early years is all in that bag. <laughs> yeah. It should be shot in that style, and then yeah, the film can become more polished as it goes along. Yeah. Um, so yeah, people, uh, people, they don't, they get into. Um, of course, when I got into it, I like I want to be a Scorsese or a Tarantino, you know. It's like so, I had aspirations as well, but. After a while, I've sort of gotten to the position where I realized that a lot of people get into it because they want to be a movie star or they want to be famous or they like to see themselves up there in the romantic comedy or the horror movie or something, but they don't really see themselves in ugly ways. They don't want to see themselves as somebody who does bad things or has really bad things happen to them. And I don't mean in like a like a funny Tarantino sort of way. I just mean horrible things. Um, I've had, and I think you told me you'd had com- uh, complications getting people to understand what you're trying to do with your with your film. I think even you said your first feature was just hard to stomach for some people like some people didn't we weren't sure what to think about it because like there's a twist like half the way through where something somebody you thought was a good guy is now just oh jesus terrible person well yeah it's not even a twist it's just kind of uh 
a just how it is. that sinks in at a certain point where you realize that you've been rooting for a heel. But yeah, it's, and I, the, I've sent you the new script. I'm guessing you haven't looked at it yet. But oh, I haven't looked at it yet. I Sorry. No, it's fine. I, I've abandoned the audience at this point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just two of these things, you know, and and I, I'm not, I'm, I'm basically at this point incapable of playing to the audience, and I've just acknowledged it, and I'm just, I'm just gonna do whatever the hell I'm gonna do. Yeah. And hopefully, I can get enough money to make it and enough people to buy in. But see, that's art. Yeah, that, that's yeah. when you know you're making art. That's what it is. I mean, and that's, yeah. and I've, you know, I've. Part of, I think, living in filmmaking for a while is realizing that there are only, like, a handful of people that can say, hey, studio, give me $50 million to go make Silence in some other country yeah. you know, about a bunch of, you know, Japanese monks being tortured for two hours. Yeah. You're going to say, yeah. oh, yeah, here's the bucks. You know, yeah. and everyone else is just making a living the best they can and trying to create in the corners where they can. I uh, I teach a lot of the directing classes, and I I keep telling them directing is what you do when you're not making money, you know, because you look you look at the uh, the career trajectory of most filmmakers who are breaking through now, and that's the they make their cheap movies, and eventually someone likes it or they don't, you know, and that's where we live. Is I'm gonna quote you on. <laughs> no. As long as you that is a I would like to have a quote in common uh, parlance. <laughs> well, it's it's because so what I what I wanted to ask you is how you've done with because I've written some some ugly stuff too. Yeah. My problem has yeah. been provocative, huh? Yeah, I know your work tends to be provocative, <laughs> and it's hard it's hard to get people to come on board with you. Low budget. If I had a budget, I'm sure that people would come on. Um, if I had a significant budget, people would come on. However, um, I never really want people who came on just for a paycheck. I want people to be like the true believer that I am in the thing. <laughs> but it's hard because uh, we still have to figure out how to make movies that we want to make. Some, there's the balance between movies that we want to make. We're independent filmmakers. The beauty of that is we don't have to compromise anybody else's vision. We can just do our thing because nobody's checking on us at the end of the week to say, how's your footage look? It's just us and Brad, whatever. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm complaining about everything. <laughs> right. So, but at the same time, it's like what? how have you gotten people – to come into your bubble so that you can make the movie you want to make at the same time. I had a uh, someone from my first feature make a remark one time. Oh no, she okay. She was uh, doing the behind the scenes. I had someone doing all the behind the scenes for my first feature, and of course I edited all the behind the scenes stuff because that's how it is. <laughs> Marketing yeah, 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 yeah. a video about people talking about you, which is fun. Yeah. Um, but it was like Tim has an incredible. <laughs> the question was Tim has an incredible way of mi- getting people to do things that they probably wouldn't want to do, <laughs> and, uh, and he just kind of nodded. Yeah, he does. Um, and I don't think they ever got to the bottom of how I do that. But uh, oh, that's the secret. That's what I want to know. Yeah, I have I have trouble with that. Tell I me the secret. Uh, for one thing, it's really actively scouting, trying to mm-hmm. find the best people who you could attain their services, and mm-hmm. one of my secrets, and I hate to get it out there because it's going <laughs> to, and I'll be like, oh, I don't want to work you down on the next one, but is up and coming, like college age or just graduated college, mm-hmm. those people need clips, and they need to prove what they can do, and they're willing mm-hmm. to do it cheap because they're building their reel. And I tend to prefer them not only because I can get them because of those facts, but also... I prefer working with them because they aren't set in their ways and they're willing to to take chances and do crazy things. And sometimes <laughs> we will we will run into issues where it's like, oh well that you know, where the novice aspect of it comes up. But for the most part, 
uh, those people do very well. Yeah. Uh, it's just finding them, and, and I think the other part is just sheer belief in what you're doing. Like, I'm, I don't consider myself a good salesperson at all. I hate it. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, just, I think it comes across when you just believe in what you're doing and are obsessed with it and you're obsessive about it. The problem I've had is um, people that are, uh, I had I had a thing that was, uh, I think, I guess the scene was between um, a trans woman who was out on a date with a, with a lesbian, with an actual, you know, woman who was a lesbian and um, I had multiple people actors um, get back to me and say I can't I can't be in something like this and I'm like lesbians like this is so the problem I've had is people who are just like morally offended or <laughs> opposed to the thing but the where we what we ran into last the on the the last thing we made the feature the feature film really pathetic and totally awkward coming soon to not a theater <laughs> near you um, was was mostly an experience it was inexperience uh, our actors who I mean not saying anything bad about them um, they were not accustomed to shooting 12 to 15 pages a day and then you got to show up tomorrow and do 12 or 15 more pages it was 115 pages of dialogue and we shot our movie in nine days um, that's well, a lot you did a block schedule we did a um, we shot for seven days okay um, over the course of about two weeks mm -hmm. and then a month later we got together with uh, and shot two more days. So we shot like nine days over over a month, basically. Yeah. But we had um, the, the, the guy, one of our guys, he was the last thing, last thing he said was um, he's like, I think what got me on this is like, I, I'm used to shooting like a five to ten page short film and you're done in two or three days. This was a, this was a real grind. And, I, and as the director, I was like, we have been saying to you for three months now that there was going to be a lot of words um, but there's, you just can't really. It's one of those things you have to, to you have you have to live through. You have to experience it yeah. to realize how much work it is. And again, to our our two um, female actresses, uh, Alethea and Caitlin, were uh, both have sort of a mostly a more theater background, yeah, so they're, they're used um, they're used to it. They they had no you know no problems, but. Uh, the, the two guys, they were they were new at it, and um, I mean we got it done. It was just it was a, it was a struggle for for them I think, and I, for us because of that. You know I, it's almost hard for me to speak to that because one of the innovations that, and I teach this to the to my classes some about approaching a feature because inevitably whenever they make a feature it's it's going to have to be micro budget like. Again, no one is going to hand you as a short filmmaker a big budget. It's going to go make a picture, probably, uh, of like, you know, Moment of Truth, my first feature, we just shot whenever the hell we could, and it took 13 months to shoot 11 days, which yeah. was a nightmare. So that's kind of the whenever model. That's the whenever you've done. Yeah, because everyone looks different. I've every done time that before, too, and people show up with haircuts. Oh yeah, and I, I lost me. that shirt. I lost that shirt that I was wearing. I'm just gonna wear this. It looks a little bit like that one. I'm like no. You can go watch Moment of Truth on Amazon by the time this is aired. And um, really, see okay. The continuity. I was worried <laughs> big time about continuity, but here's the thing: no one ever says anything about it. And I've even told people like he, there's a head wound that appears and disappears throughout. <laughs> and. <laughs> and I've even had people watch it who I've talked to this about. They're like, oh, yeah, you said that, didn't you? So which means that we did something right because they're whether they hate the movie or not, they're, they don't hate it because of the continuity. Right. Um, but So that's one model, and I say don't do that unless you absolutely have to. Then there's the block model, which is, you know, we're going to do five, six, seven days straight, take a couple days, resume. Yeah. And then what we did on Testament, which is kind of in between, which is the long weekend model, which I would really highly recommend, which is like mm -hmm. 
Friday through Sunday or Thursday through Sunday, take four, three or four days. And, you know, we did, we did uh, three days up in Alabama in February. We used that to help raise money for the rest of it. And then we came back, and over the course of May, I think we did four weekends, like long weekends. And we knocked it out in a month, but uh-huh. it wasn't as draining. And not only is it not as draining as the seven days where you're just like, what are we doing? What is, what's happening today? But also, uh, it gives you a chance to kind of adjust and adapt and say, yeah. eh, this isn't really working. Maybe we need to do this slightly differently, and you have a few days to actually to do yeah. it. The, and I don't even feel bad about it. It took me a, uh, took me a while to, to get to where I felt fine with how we shot Really Pathetic Until the Awkward. It was... Uh, I think we never worked more than two days in a row for that first seven days. Mm-hmm. Two days, then we had a day off, then we shot again the next day. And I think, but I think we also never had more than two or three days off in between. Um, yeah. And I and I was, was like, one day off where we had to do reshoots. Yeah, we yeah we had to give up one of our off days to to make up for yeah. So we really were supposed to have shot in eight days, but we shot in nine. So. We failed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the only people who can make me feel uh, luxurious in my nine to ten days. Well, but we, so we, I, I started thinking uh, it's like if we were real filmmakers, real air quotes, uh, we would have shot this whole thing in a week, or or you know nine days, like back to back to back to back. Maybe I had a Sunday off and then shot the. Um, but then I started thinking the way we're making it, which was like, I'm, there are people that work with no money, and then there are people that work with zero money. We were working with zero money. <laughs> I was like cooking. I was cooking food yeah. the night before a production, so I could feed the crew the next day. We, we weren't buying lunch. We, we weren't doing any of that stuff that you always hear. Uh, feed your crew. You're like, yeah, that means, you know, <laughs> yeah. So. But uh, the way we're making it, if we were shooting back to back to back to back to back days, I would have started losing losing grasp of things. Oh yeah. Because yeah. there is no time to prep for the next day. Mm-hmm. If we're working, to, it's it's not like I had months and months of prep. The months I, I didn't have, I I mean Brad and I we were we were there and we were helping each other as much as we could. And Brad was basically serving as in like an AD function. But there's only so much he can do too with all the stuff that was going on. If we had had the twenty million dollar, fifty million dollar silence budget uh, that Scorsese gets for his basically silent film, <laughs> is um. We we wouldn't have had those problems. We had did for different problems, then we could have worked back to back days, you know, because we would have been prepared for it. But we had to basically solve to, and had trailers that we could go into. We would have had to we had to solve today's problems. We have to solve tomorrow's problems before we could ever shoot, you know. And it's just it's different. It's a different way of doing it, and it does it still requires stamina, and it still requires real commitment to it because it could have very easily. Uh, where I got nervous is when we shot in July and didn't meet back again until September to shoot those last two days. Um, I was getting, I was starting to get real nervous that we were like going to blow it off. You know, I mean, was, okay, well, let's shoot in October. Okay, November. Next thing you know, those last two days haven't happened yet, and it's four months away from the original production. It's hard to get the momentum. And the actors moved. Yeah, it's hard to get the men- momentum back up. Yeah, one of one of the actors moved and didn't even tell us he was gone. That sounds familiar. So, I've had, I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but oh, yeah. I liked it. What I liked about your film Testament was that it didn't seem like a. It did. It seemed you could tell it was an indie film, but it didn't feel low budget. It didn't feel because you had so many different locations and sets, and stuff that I know you probably like searched pr- for practical locations for. But it didn't. It didn't feel. Something about it didn't feel like they made this for like zero money. So, good job. Your location scouting on that film was was great. Well, thank you. I think it actually almost works against me sometimes because what I'm finding is like uh, I, one of the it was a damning quote from the guy who one of the guys who runs Slam Dance it was mm-hmm. like one of the things we look for is just that indie film vibe. 
And, like, I think people... Like, Testament reached uh, a technical aspect of looking a lot like a mainstream release. Mm -hmm. And so then when you're in that realm, then people expect main sh everything to be like a mainstream release. And it's a very indie-spirited film that's not going to give you what you want. And people, I think, are more accepting of that with the shaky camera and the, the more choppy indie look. It's like, oh, well, that's okay, this is an indie film. I, I don't know, I've, I've just encountered, like, it's hit barriers, and I think really one of them is, like, it looks too much, too <laughs> almost looks too professional. And I don't know, it, it's kind of surprised me, because you wait, as a filmmaker, you're always like, how can I make this look better? How can I push this? Right. I think we succeed in a lot of ways, and it, it seems like it hasn't benefited the film as much as I thought it might have in years. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> we're always trying to, or at least I am, trying to make our $500 short film look like a $5,000 short film. It's, and I got that that line of thinking from Robert Rodriguez's book back in the day. He's like, look, when he went off and did uh, Mariachi, the sequel to Mariachi, oh, Desperado, Desperado um, he made that for $7 million, and but was trying to make it look like a $30 million movie. And uh, first of all, the fact that Desperado could have been made for $30 million at all in the first place is crazy, because now that would be a, like a 50 to $80 million movie, yeah, maybe, maybe a $100 million movie, but back in the 90s, you on know, film. Die... On film. On film, yeah. yeah. I just rewatched Die Hard, and I'm thinking... Uh, Die Hard was made for $25 million in the 80s, and that was a lot. They were like, is that a $25 million budget? Is it going to flop? I'm like, $25 million. Like, people, that's the level of movies where, like, studios shit that out. They're just like, Here, oh, okay, we'll give you $20 million. Go, go, don't even bother us anymore. We don't want to see what you're working on. What was, uh, Deadpool was something kind of ridiculous, wasn't it? I think it was 50 or 60 million. It was 59 million or something like that. That that is low for a super yeah hero film. On that film. Well, so what are you what are you working on? This this script you sent me. What's yeah. it called? Ian? What's the script called? <laughs> it's called Echoes. Echoes. Is it post apocalyptic like your other one, or is it completely different? Or post 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 apocalyptic. <laughs> post post. So it's like the day after. Well, it's. Uh... <laughs> Uh, but it, at the same time, it, it's purely allegorical. So yeah. it's uh, I made it less pure allegory with this latest drafts because people, you know, people are reading it and they're just like, "What? What? what, what are you doing? <laughs> like, cool. Good. Um, well, since you've abandoned the audience, that's exactly. the response they're looking well, for. There's a lot of like the, you know, these people know me and they're like, "But I guess if you're going in that direction, you know." And it, if you don't care what the audience thinks, I'm like, yeah. But uh, it's – and actually, I think it's got a pretty catchy uh, a catchy concept. It's mm -hmm. just execution is going to probably be less marketable. Um, it's a uh, – everyone has been wiped out. There's no humans anymore, and a man – takes a couple of babies out into the woods into a house and starts raising them, and it's very Adam and Eve-ish. Nice. This, this mysterious God character, and it'll be four seasons, so we'll see them as kids, then as in the spring, and then in the summer when things are getting hot and they're starting to get hot, and then now they have kids in the fall and in the winter. You know, Now we're going into Cain and Abel, and the whole idea of the echoes is that you know the same behaviors start repeating themselves again and it mm -hmm. sort of looking at how much of that is inescapable as part of human nature and what's driving those things and all kinds of questions. Uh, that's, that's cool, except you have to cast your three actors four times. Kids. kids. Yeah, and kids. Avoided, avoided relentlessly. I, did, I, have a, I have a kid in... There's one girl in Testament. I don't know if you remember that. His daughter... Mm -hmm. She is in like you know a few pages, so we had a few scenes with her, and she doesn't talk much. And then 
Moment of Truth, I had the child versions of the two leads very briefly. But I've always avoided it because kids, you know, you throw out the whole book of how to talk to actors and everything. You have to rewrite everything and extend your patience as far as you can. So that'll be a challenge. And then I'm planning on shooting in Alabama, which means we got to transport kids and their parents. So there's there's some logistical challenges associated. In some ways, it's you know fewer locations, fewer actors, but in other ways, you know, and we got to worry about aging, makeup, things like that. So you got to have some. Yeah, different new challenges. <laughs> so uh, do you know when you're going to shoot? I'm kind of hell bent on shooting it next year, like in the fall. Okay, so you have a you have fall like of, ten months. Fall of nineteen. That's yeah, why I'm trying see. to get the script pretty much done. Started uh, talking to some potential producers, which has always been a shortcoming and always will in independent micro budget filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, kind of been eyeing various actors, so it's just finding the time in the next few months to kind of start executing and and again going back to the initiative thing. It's, you know, just taking those steps periodically and, and momentum, which you raise, which is a, an essential word in, in what we do. Yeah. Um, there just has to be things happening. And you have to yeah. find a way just to keep things happening or nothing will happen. It, it's as weird as that sounds, just like people can sense when things are moving. As long as things are happening, people feel like there's going to be a film out of it. Yeah. But they can kind of sense when it's stalling, and, and you have to preserve that feeling of, mm -hmm. we're moving forward, we're moving forward, something is happening, things are coming together. And I, I was up in Alabama, you know, which I have a lot of in-laws up there, and we started toward locations pretty definitively while I was up there for Christmas some. And so I feel good about that. You know, I have some progress starting to, to happen. Yeah. But once I get to the semester, it's going to be challenging. You're so right about the momentum thing. Uh, we had actors who we really wanted to work with bail on us um, because our film was taking so... it was so We're having such a hard time getting it off to launch, you know, to go. So we recast our film probably tw three times. First time we were happy with our happy with everybody, but it was taking so long to get the couple of other elements put together that one guy basically had to go, and then we recast, and then things didn't work out with that guy professionally. So we then we had to recast again, and that's how we ended up with the people that we have in our short and not in our feature film. That's how we ended up with our people in there, and it was because of lack of momentum at the very beginning. That one little thing set off a chain reaction. And, uh, yeah, and I've shot a feature film the way you said the first time you did it, where you shot it over the course of, like, a year or whatever, on the weekends or whatever. Um, that's impossible to maintain momentum that way. Oh, yeah. What we ended up doing on that one was we were about halfway through that year, and I basically I cut a trailer out of what we had strictly to rally the troops, you know, like... yeah. Because I could feel it sagging, and I was, and things were starting to go wrong. And it's like, you know, I just wanted to put something out there, and everyone got excited because the trailer looks really good. And all of a sudden, it's yeah. like, oh, cool! I'm, this is still worth investing my time in. You know, as right. getting people invested is the hardest thing, as you said, and they just yeah. need to buy in. Like, this is worth my time, and I will be better for having been on a part of this thing. Awesome. It's almost like indie filmmaking is about learning how to not only motivate people to volunteer, but to manage volunteers. You know what I mean? Because there is an art to when people are doing something for you for free. There's an art to keeping them happy and uh, keep making them feel like they're contributing. Uh, you know, that's an important part of yeah. You know, your filmmaking crew is everyone needs to feel like uh, they need to believe in it in a way, feel like there there's something in it that they can get out of it, um, but also that they're contributing, that they're, um, you know, making a difference. Like they, they wouldn't be easily replaced by anyone else, you know, like they got to feel important. I think that's one of the benefits of a smaller crew is, is that people are more involved, like... I discourage micro-budget crews from getting too big because mm. the 
the worst thing you can do is having people stand around. Like, mm. if everyone is engaged in something, and it's finding that sweet spot between too small where you're doing too much yourself and things are falling through the cracks like happened on Moment of Truth at times. So, like, just mm. having just enough where everyone is engaged and contributing without, you know, the, the standing around and the waiting. Yeah. Uh, that's, it's it's like you got to make it feel personal to everyone in mm-hmm. some way, and that then they feel like they're they're um, that's what they get out of it. That's their pay, you know. Um, they they don't feel used if they feel they're getting something out of it, you know. Yeah, and, and I think another thing I have with a lot of you know I do a lot of directing classes, and they're all scared to cast actual actors. They all want to do their friends, so I make them cast actors. Right. Mm-hmm. Working with actors, working with actual actors can be intimidating. Terrifying at first, yeah. Because you don't speak the same language. Mm-hmm. That's why you have to study. I mean, it would not it's not a bad thing to make yourself act. Oh yeah, absolutely. Read books, you know, study. Um, but uh I tell them like don't feel bad about getting them to work on your you know, they're all oh, it's a student film. I'm like, well, they wouldn't audition for your student film if they weren't getting something out of it. Like, yeah. obviously, Tom Cruise doesn't want to be in your stupid student film, but um, you know, actors who are coming up and need to fill the reel with quality mm-hmm. clips. There's a yeah. reason they're showing up, and that yeah. that's what they're after. And your job is just to give them a quality product to put in their reel. And, yeah. and as long as you provide that, then it's a two-way street, and everyone is benefiting. They need you. You need them. It should all work out. And the hardest part. Be respectful, obviously. Yeah. It's it's hard for me to conceive of like the Fantastic Four director or whatever Trank. You know, you hear these horror stories about asshole directors going off yeah. on everybody. And it's like when you work in the micro budget realm, it's like you you can't be an asshole if you want anyone you to show up the next day. Like. You have to be the nicest director imaginable. Like. But it's weird because it, there is a there's another balance like right in there because you also have to command your respect as a director. Like you have to command it. So for many many times I have been way too nice about mm-hmm. about things and not not that I should feel like I should be more rude, but I've been more too not nice. People enough, maybe you're... yeah. People say that they can be there and then. At the last minute, they can't, and I'm my my thing is, we well, can't be a dick about it because they're just donating their time anyway. Or if you're paying them, it's not a whole lot. Um, I get it, but part of me is like you said, part of me is like you said you would be here. Are are you going to be a professional? Or are you going to be a flake? Because mm-hmm. um, I'm here, and if I I'm here, and I've worked, I've gotten all these other people here, and now you're just going to drop out. Um, is weird because you have to be nice and um, in charge at the same time. That's a hard thing to do. Because I'm real good at being nice. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the world's greatest at being a giving people the dirty look, you know, thing. You know, that's what I have Brad for. That that's my job. Brad, I love Brad's face is a dirty look. <laughs> <laughs> Brad. Resting Brad. Resting face, Brad face. Yeah, the bad cop. Yeah, the bad cop. Yeah, every time, every time uh, Beckenmeyer had to, you know, wanted to say something to somebody, uh, I was like, "Oh, I'll do it." But then ultimately, he, ultimately, he'd be like, "No, no, no, we can't. We gotta play nice." But I would always volunteer. I will tell them to <laughs> get the fuck out here. Let's record. Learn your lines. And I'm not very good at pretending. So if I had something to say, you could tell it, even if I wasn't saying it. It's all over my face. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that face. So okay, so where do people go to find you? Go to find your stuff. Uh, Tim Ritter, one sixty one, I think, is my Facebook because uh, we're numbered, right? Is that how Facebook works? Uh, I'll look up here. Yeah, Tim Ritter dot one. Tim dot Ritter dot one sixty one after Facebook. If you want to find me, uh, Moment of Truth Movie dot com. Testamentfilm.com, uh, Facebook.com slash Moment of Truth Film, I believe. Let me see. Moment of Truth. 
You know, it's, so, it's such a pain to maintain all these digital. Things. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah. Do, you, do you put stuff up on Vimeo or YouTube or? What? Uh, you yeah, you can find things? 315 films on YouTube. Uh, let's see, and there's all kinds of stuff that no one's watching. That the treasure trove of behind-the-scenes stuff you don't care about. But uh, we made tons and tons of behind-the-scenes yep. videos. So three one five. Do me a favor, send me the links. I'll put them up on the post. I will. I will. I would love to get our our views up from the paltry numbers that they are. Uh, <laughs> well, good luck with that. I don't think we're gonna help that much. <laughs> well, I'm gonna drive people to you, and you're gonna drive them back to me. Yeah, that works. That you know, works. One of my my long festering dreams is a filmmaking collaborative, where at least we can all pool our tiny audiences and yeah, have a yeah, yeah. I think so too. But I, uh, I love on. that. Well, it was a your own project, let alone undertake something like that. Even though I don't think it would take much to do. Writers gr- hey, man, there's writer groups. There are writer groups. There should be filmmaker groups. Yeah, that's what 315 Films in the early days was. We actually, in those Fort Myers early days, we had three or four directors creating work under the 315 Films banner. And because we were all doing shorts, like we could fill up a festival with 315 nice. stuff, and I remember when I came up to Orlando, I gave someone a business card, and they're like, oh, 315 Films. Like, they didn't know my name, but they knew 315 Films because they'd seen that logo popping up on everything. Nice. And there's, I think there's value in that if we could ever figure it out, like, because each of us, it takes forever to crank out a feature or whatever we're doing, but yeah. if you've got five people <clears throat> simultaneously under the same banner, then at least someone is always producing something and pushing something, and it looks like you're all being much more productive and yeah. generating content. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's why uh, local filmmakers need to, even if they're like us, and, you know, they don't like to promote themselves mm. or talk to people. That's me. I don't like to talk to people. Oh, but, I, you know, I get with Mike, and then Mike doesn't mind talking <laughs> to people, and then he schedules us to meet with people and then I'm like okay I'll go but <laughs> the point is you have to <laughs> yeah. you have to meet I mean you have to meet with your local filmmakers you gotta and that's no another reason why you know we make films and we support other filmmakers and go to film festivals because and that's why we do a show because we need to you know, band to help each other out. Even mm-hmm. if we're just doing an interview and just a few people find out about it, so what? Um, but you know, it's. I think that's the only way we're gonna um, get all of our stuff out is if we, you know, combine our powers. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, let's do a monthly. Let's do a monthly thing. Even if we just have coffee once a month. Well, uh, at some at some point, we're going to create a joint Facebook. And YouTube accounts where we can just pimp stuff all the time in the shared account. And people come for Beckemeyer and they see Ritter and they come for Ritter and they see Beckemeyer. And... Nobody will ever come for Brad, though, but that's okay. <laughs> everyone, everyone will come for Brad and, and we'll too. And we'll... They will come to laugh at me. It's one thing I'm good for. <laughs> all right. Just look at me. Brad's well, rising tide will, will raise all of our boats. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to contact us, we are filmreveriepodcast at gmail.com. I'm Becca Meyer on Twitter and Instagram, and Brad is Balding Ewok. Balding Ewok. And uh, Tim is tim.ritter.161. <laughs> <laughs> that one's so uh, generic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Filmmaker161. And I'm looking at YouTube right now, and actually, I guess 315. If you do youtube.com slash 315 films spelled out 315, you'll mm-hmm. find us. Or you can just search 315 films Tim Ritter and you'll find okay, all cool. kinds of, of good stuff. Excellent. Well, it's always fun talking to you because I feel like we've lived similar but separate paths, okay. filmmaking paths. Like parallel, we've gone... parallel work. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for this time. Brad, it is your turn to say. Oh, thanks for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for coming on. It was a great conversation. Oh, we don't care. (laughs) We do care. And, (laughs) Brad. The end. And cut.
Film Reverie Podcast is a production of Super Mega Ultra Entertainment and is produced by Michael Beckemeyer and Bradley Kingston. If you're enjoying this podcast, please be sure to leave us a five-star review in iTunes and visit filmreverie.com to listen to past episodes and be sure to click like or subscribe wherever you find us. That's it for this time. We'll see you again next week with another episode of Film Reverie.